So if you lived in ancient Bible times, odds are you lived under the authority of a king. And many of these kings claimed that they were oh. gods, and they would even call themselves the image of God. Meaning they had authority to tell people what to do, order things to be made. Yeah, they got to define good and evil. And these kings would often make statues of themselves, which in Hebrew were called selim, often translated as idol or image. But for Israel, they didn't view their kings as the god. In fact, they were never supposed to even make images of God. That's exactly right, and that was really unique for that time and culture. This is rooted, first of all, in Israel's belief that you can't reduce the creator God down to any one thing in creation. But there's another reason. People aren't to make images of God because God has already made images of himself. When did he do that? Well, let's go to page one of the Bible. And the first person we meet there is God. He's the one with authority over all creation. He speaks and creation obeys, and he defines what is good and not good. In other words, he alone is king. But then surprisingly, as the pinnacle of all of God's creative work, he makes humans, and he calls all of them the image of God. Wait, so he gives all humans the authority to rule. Exactly, that's what he goes on to say. He tells the humans to subdue the earth and to rule it. And so this task that once belonged only to elite kings is here in the Bible the task of every human being. This was a revolutionary statement in its day because all humans are being called to rule and to participate in the human project. So what does this mean? I mean, how are we all supposed to rule? So the picture we get in Genesis is gardening. Gardening? Yes. Gardening. So they rule the earth by cultivating it, by harnessing all of the earth's raw potential and then making something more and new out of it. So growing food for each other. Yes, but that also includes growing families then, which become neighborhoods. And then they create communities where people are going to work and take care of each other and build businesses and cities that will expand to new places and so on. So ruling is really the day-to-day -day acts of our work and creativity. Yes, we take the world somewhere. This is humanity's divine and sacred task. Yeah, and this all sounds really nice. And humans have designed some pretty great things. But just as often we create things that cause a lot of suffering and a lot of injustice, so maybe we shouldn't actually be ruling. Oh. Yeah, so the Bible addresses this. In Genesis, what happens is that God gives humans a choice about how they're going to rule. So are they going to use their authority for the benefit of others, which is God's definition of good, or are they going to turn away and define good and evil for themselves and use their authority for self-advantage? And in the story, they choose to define good and evil on their own terms. And so this is the Bible's depiction of the human condition. So sometimes we pull off amazingly good stuff, but just as often, despite our best intentions, we act selfishly and we create evil in the world. And so we're stuck as mediocre rulers making a mess of things. But that's not the end of the story. So the Bible goes on and it makes this claim that all of this was resolved when God bound himself to humanity through Jesus. And he showed us what it looks like to truly rule as a human. So what does it look like? Well, Jesus ruled by serving and by seeking the best for others, by putting himself underneath them and loving not just his friends, but also his enemies. And that's not a typical way to rule. And not only that, Jesus confronted the consequences of all of the evil and the death that we have created by our messed up ways of ruling. And he takes it. I mean, he lets it kill him. And so when the New Testament writers looked back to Jesus' resurrection, they see a whole new future opening up for all humanity. Jesus is a new way to be human. Yeah, that's why they called Jesus the image of God or the new human. And not only that, they also believe that Jesus' divine life and power is now available to heal and to transform us to become our life and power. And this sounds really nice, but what does it really look like? So practically, the Apostle Paul said it looks like people being filled by Jesus' own presence and spirit, filled with love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and integrity and gentleness and self-control. He says 
this is the new humanity that God wants to create in us so that we become people in whom God's image is being restored, people who will move the human project forward. And that's actually how the story of the Bible ends. It's a renewed world where God is on his throne and his servants are all around him, but they're the ones ruling over this new world, taking it into new uncharted territory with Jesus as their healer and their guide. morning. It's good to see you guys here again this morning. We are on the second message in our series called The Weight of Our Words. If you are somebody who didn't have the opportunity to hear the message from last week, I want to strongly encourage you to go back and listen to it. It was very introductory. Um, the part that I think is really, really important for you is to really hear the passages of scripture that Cody and I um, shared with everybody last week that give you just a small peek into what the Bible tells us about the use of our words. Today we move into the second message, and this one is on the, the, how we're anchored into um, how this uh, message, this entire series is anchored into our authority and the fact that we are image bearers of God. And that is the why. That's the why behind the weight of our words. So we need to understand this piece, that our words carry a tremendous amount of weight because of who we are as human beings made in the image of God. And also as believers, how much authority God has given us when we speak. Cody spoke last week and said, we're not just trying to get the church to be nicer although that's fine. There's nothing wrong with being nicer. What we're hoping to do throughout this series is to help everybody understand and to slow down a bit and to really inspect and think about your words. And are they aligning with God or are they aligning with killing, stealing, and destroying things, whether they be yourself, other people, movements, organizations, those kinds of things. We sing about authority and we love it. It sounds great, doesn't it? And it's really warm and comforting when we hear, oh, we're made in the image of God. We look like our dad. That's really comforting. But then when we move on to think about the responsibility that comes with that, it's sobering. We really need to study the word of God and learn to understand this and learn to hold ourselves and others accountable. There is a Bible verse that we shared parts of um, in our message last week. And Lane preached on this when he spoke a few months ago on the book of James. But we're going to come back to this because it's such an anchoring part of this entire series. James 3, 9 through 18. With the tongue, we praise our Lord and Father. And with it, we curse human beings. So if you were here last week, when Cody, when we first brought Cody in to help plan the series, and he's going to be preaching very specifically on cursing in two weeks, He was like, what is this cursing stuff? He didn't hear much about it growing up. Uh, He's heard a little more about it here, but uh, still wrestling with, does this mean cussing? What does this actually mean? And the Bible tells us in James and in other places in Scripture that our words can curse. They function as a curse when we release them from our mouths. And it's right here in the book of James. So with the tongue, we praise our Lord and Father. With it, we curse human beings who have been made in God's likeness. Out of the same mouth come praise and cursing. My brothers and sisters, this should not be. Can both fresh water and salt water flow from the same spring? My brothers and sisters, can a fig tree bear olives or a grapevine bear figs? Neither can a salt spring produce fresh water. Who is wise and understanding among you? Let them show it by their good life, by deeds done in the humility that comes from wisdom. But if you harbor bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast about it or deny the truth. Such wisdom does not come down from heaven, but is earthly, unspiritual, demonic. For where you have envy and selfish ambition, there you find disorder and every evil practice. But the wisdom that comes from heaven is first of all pure, then peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy and good fruit, impartial and sincere. Peacemakers who sow in peace 
reap a harvest of righteousness. So this passage of scripture is a good one for helping us understand what the fruit looks like. So specifically, as we talk about the weight of our words, the words that are coming out of our mouth, are they connected and is the fruit of those words selfish ambition? Or are the fruit of our words impartial and sincere and full of mercy? That's how we know. We look to the Bible, we listen to God's voice as we pray and as we worship and as we go about our day, and we are asking the Lord to bring awareness to our words because that's where most of our power is. It's in our words. James clearly understood the wrestling match that we're in as fallen human beings when he wrote this this passage. I'm sure you all feel that. Do we walk and live and work and interact with our family and our neighbors every day remembering that we bear the image of God, that we are made in his likeness, and that the words that come from our mouth need to reflect that. I'm going to go back to these verses in Genesis. They were mentioned in the video just to remind us that this is, this is God's design. Genesis 1.27, so God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them, male and female, he created them. Genesis 9, 6, whoever sheds human blood, by humans shall their blood be shed. For in the image of God has God made mankind. So all of us here on earth are made in the image of God. I want to tell you a little story. And I heard this story probably more than a decade ago, and I can't remember some of the details of it. For instance, the name of the pastor. I do remember it was Florida. And there was a pastor in Florida, and I was listening to a teaching about our words, about cursing and blessing. And this was an example used in the teaching. And in this story, the pastor in Florida was uh, working to, bring, to create in his church a worship team and a choir. And he was having a lot of trouble. People weren't volunteering. He basically had nobody. And he was trying and trying and trying and trying, and he was getting really frustrated. So he began to complain and um, just criticize. And he was just miserable about the fact that none of these people would volunteer for this job. And he kept speaking about how these people were just, you know, not interested in volunteering and they should be doing this and they weren't doing this. And he was complaining and criticizing and nobody was filling those chairs. And he had an encounter where where he understood that his words were being released and power was going out with his words and he shifted into blessing so he began to walk into the area where this worship group this uh, choir would be seated on a sunday morning and he would go and bless every person who would sit in those chairs and don't you know that they showed up as he began to release blessing from his mouth the people came the people came and he learned a very valuable lesson that what he was speaking was keeping people from stepping into that role. You know, over the years I've seen this, both in the corporate world where uh, managers and leaders will lead teams, I've also seen it in ministry where, where there's a leader or there's a group of leaders who are not seeing the fruit that they want to see and they began to complain. And the same thing happens. The ministry tends to kind of tail off and die if that's what's happening among the leaders, if they're complaining about the people who aren't serving well, the people aren't coming in those cases. And the opposite is also true. I've seen it in the corporate world. And again, in the corporate world, my experience there, it's not a Christian experience, but the principles of God are on the earth. Whether someone is aware of how they're working, whether they call themselves a believer or not, sowing and reaping, for instance, that's everywhere, whether you're a believer or not. So this is also true. So in the corporate world, when there's a leader who is celebrating their team and blessing their team, that team is growing and thriving. Same is true for ministry, and I've seen it in both places. We see it also in children. You know, if you have a really active child, Um, a child that you might consider challenging. Think about your words. The words that are being released, even if they're out of earshot of that child, they're still being released, and they have power in them. My friend Doreen Leckler teaches on this topic, but even more than that, she's pretty expansive. 
Some of you may remember her. She used to attend here, but she and her husband, Brett, have since moved to Florida. She, she uh, owns and leads an organization called Destiny Makers, and she teaches on thought life and words uh, prolifically. She knows more about the, all of it, what the Bible says about it and the science behind it um, than anybody I know. And we had her teaching the youth a number of years ago upstairs, teaching them about their words and the power of their words and the power of their thoughts. And I, w- I went up to see her uh, teach the youth, and she was teaching the concepts about b- how your beliefs really um, impact where you go in life, what you're saying, what you're thinking, how those beliefs will create a path for you or not because of the way God designed us. And she was asking the kids, these were mostly middle schoolers, uh, some of the things they could and couldn't do. And she had kids raising their hand and saying, well, I can't sing. And the first thing she said was, well, when were your vocal cords removed? Which, of course, made the middle schoolers laugh. But then she went on and asked, like, who told you that? Like, where did that belief come from that you can't sing? And most of the kids didn't really know where it came from, but they believed they couldn't sing. So she went on to challenge that and say, well, you know, most of the singers are trained and they practice a lot. You know, there is some natural talent there. But there's a lot of work involved in learning to sing. Have you done that and seen poor results? Well, no. Okay, well then let me teach you how to um, think about and say this a little differently, she would say to the middle schoolers. I'd like you to say, I have chosen not to practice and train in singing. That's true also, right? That's true. It's not true that I can't sing. But if you release that and you begin to believe it and you walk in that, then you've kind of closed the door for the rest of your life. You go on believing, well, I can't sing. The truth is, if you, if you practice and if you trained and if you worked with a voice coach, you probably could learn to sing. It's just not something you're interested in. So let's think about how we release words and how we manage our thoughts in that. I thought that was a fabulous um, example. So it's not true that sticks and stones will break our bones, but words will never hurt me. Who heard that when you were young? I heard that all the time. I mean, that was I was born in the 60s, and that's kind of how parents taught you to deal with hurtful words. Well, like, don't let them bug you. The reality is they're quite powerful, and they do wound and, and injure and, and oppress at times and close things down at times. What's really true is that our words matter a whole lot to all of creation, and we bear a tremendous amount of responsibility. It's not that we want our church to live in non-reality, though. And we said that last week. We're not asking you to pretend you can do everything. We're not asking you to be positive for the sake of being positive. Let's say you have a friend or a colleague that is having a struggle of some sort with managing their finances, for instance. So it's true to say this person is struggling to learn to manage their finances, and that there are ways that they can get better at managing their finances and we can bring help around that. But it wouldn't be, um, it would be holding them back if we said something like, well, you're just terrible at that. You're never going to be good at that. You're never going to be good at managing money. That's different than coming alongside identifying, well, there is a problem here. But the problem really isn't that you can't or will never be able to manage money. The problem is you need some training and you need some guidance and you need some help. And actually there are people who can help you do that. Do you see the difference there? How the words are very, very different? So we're not asking you to pretend that someone who is struggling with managing money is great at it. We're not saying do that. That doesn't make any sense. But what do our words mean to that person if we say, well, you're just never going to be good at managing money? And if that person believes it and walks it out, then what happens in their life? We're going to move a little bit into how, who and why we've already talked about. We are made in the image of God, and the who is God. He decided that we are made in the image of God. But I want to talk a little bit about the how now. You know, the Bible tells us that we are not supposed to lean on our own understanding. There was another line that used to go around when I was a kid, and my family repeated it all the time. God helps those who help themselves. 
I believed that was in the Bible until I read the Bible. And I was like, that, not only is that not in there, it's actually the opposite. <laughs> He's like, I'm the, van- I'm the vine, you're the branch. Lean not on your own understanding. 1 Corinthians 1.19 says, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, the intelligence of the intelligent, of the intelligent I will frustrate. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Most of you probably have heard this one. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to him, and he will make your paths straight. So we have to lean on God. So that means studying the scripture, always praying and asking him to give us insight into things, connecting with others in our community in the body of Christ, and asking for their perception and their input so that we can learn to release God's truthful words that will bring his grace and mercy. You guys remember that I told a story last week about a a parent, uh, two parents that believed their adult child throughout that child's entire life to be irresponsible. But then when they leaned in on God and got God's understanding, God said, well, actually, that child is adventurous. But when they're looking at the behavior when the child is 10 or 14 or or eight, or whatever it was, they're like, well, that's irresponsible. Well, God actually needed that person, made that person to be adventurous, because God had some really big things in mind for that particular child that required adventure. We cannot see and discern clearly without God. None of us can. There's nobody in here who can figure out those kinds of things without God, not one of us. So we must learn to ask him, to seek him, to think, to pray, to dig in with him when we're looking at something and we're tempted to speak, well, you can't, you aren't, you never, over ourselves, over other people, over organizations, over churches, over moves of God. Not only are we image bearers of God, though, but he also gave us a tremendous amount of authority. Listen to this from Mark 16. He said to them, go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. And these signs will accompany those who believe. In my name, they will drive out demons. They will speak in new tongues. They will pick up snakes with their hands. And when they drink deadly poison, it will not hurt them at all. They will place their hands on sick people and they will get well. I don't know about you, but I can't do any of that. (laughs) Like, when was the last time you drank deadly poison and it didn't hurt you? Yesterday I heard somebody say. (laughs) So God has given us authority, spiritual authority. I have seen demons move, for sure. And I have prayed for people who have gotten well. I have never picked up a snake, and I do not intend to. My son does all the time, but I do not. But I've seen the miraculous power of God many times. That does not come from me. I cannot do that. That's only because God has given us authority to do it. One of my favorite examples uh, or illustrations to understand the authority that we have in God, and I'm sure some of you in the room have heard this before, but I want you to picture with me um, a four-way stop with a light, and the light is broken. And a police officer comes and stands in the middle of this four-way stop. And the police officer is saying to this car, stop. To this car, you can come through now. Now you can, you need to stop. Now you can come through. The police officer begins to direct traffic. That police officer does not have more power than the car. If the car drove into the middle of the intersection and the police officer stood and tried to push it, who would win? The car. Right? The car has a lot more physical power than the police officer. But what does the police officer have? Authority. The police officer is wearing a badge that says, I have authority to stand here and tell you whether you can come or go. Conferred authority is the same with God. God has given us authority. So much, in fact, that in Mark 11.23, he tells us that we could speak to a mountain. And it would be moved. You speak to the mountain. You use your words. You speak to the mountain. You don't get your shovel out and begin to dig and move it. You speak to the mountain, and the mountain will move if you have faith. He has given us his authority. Do you remember that Jesus has stopped storms? 
waves have died down, wind has died down. The Lord has authority over his creation. So he's not kidding when he says, if you speak to the mountain and tell it to move, it'll move. As image bearers with authority who are made by God to subdue and to govern and to steward the earth, to push back the demonic, it's not just that people need to grow and mature and the church needs to learn about the power in their faith. We also have responsibility to God to govern here. He's given us that responsibility with that authority over the demonic. We can push that back as we understand that and see entire regions develop Christianity and move in their faith. We better understand how powerful our words are. We better stop and begin to think when we say, well, I can't do that or this person can't do that, or never, or always. We better start to think about that. We're so powerful. Our words, and it's not just that our words are powerful when we're teaching or preaching or praying. It's our everyday words. It's all of them. It's all the time. Our words, we are partnering either with our adversary, if we're killing and destroying, which is saying, I can't sing, is killing that gift or that opportunity, right? I do say that all the time. i got to be honest. I use that because I say it all the time. If you sit in our staff, there's like three of us that aren't worship leaders. Everybody else in the entire staff, Cody and Evan and Cindy and Sherry and Hirsch and John King, six of them play instruments and sing. And Lane and Jen and I will often go, no, we can't do that. So I, well, though I understand this well and I believe in it, I still catch myself saying stuff like that. Now, I have to be honest. The truth is I don't want to sing like that. I don't want to be up here with the microphone and sing. So that's what I need to learn to say instead of I can't sing. And instead of an instrument, I need to learn to say, well, I have, I've decided not to be trained in that. I need to learn to say that. So those are fun examples. But think about the examples where there would be more destruction if you said something, well, I can't or I never, or you said it to a person or a child. Right? That's really powerful. I'm going to invite the worship team to come up. We are here to build up. We are here to speak life. We are here to conquer. We are here to set captives free. That's our assignment from Jesus. And this is something... If this is a new topic to you, you're probably drinking out of the fire hose right now, I would imagine. If you've been walking with the Lord for a while and you already know this, I hope like me that you're feeling some conviction to tighten this up and to slow down a bit and to learn to lean into God a little harder about your words and to stop and think and especially to go back. Like if you've said something, if you've released the I can'ts or I will never, or you will always, if you've released those, go back and repair that, renounce that, and release the truth. Ask God what the truth is. I'm going to invite you guys, when we start worship, if you want to devote your tongue and your mouth to God, if you want God to help you, if you, if you have decided, God, I want to be used as a powerful vessel for bringing life and setting captives free and conquering evil, I want to invite you to step out into the aisles or to come up and worship as your declaration that this is your desire to God. And also ask him as you worship to help you. Like, I need so much help in this. I, I imagine that some of you are the same way, but I need help in this. I need him to remind me. I need him to speak quickly when I'm like, God, what is the truth here before I say something that is going to create an obstacle? Help me, God. Help me, God. Father, we love you so much. And as we stand to worship, Lord, I pray uh, that you would begin to stir our hearts and help us to understand how we can partner with you in our everyday words. Lord, help us to grasp this concept and to walk in it with power and with authority. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.